Welcome, students, to another exciting slash boring discussion on chemical kinetics from Chapter 14's coverage of Chemical Kinetics. In this action-free installment, I'm going to teach you some exciting things about chemical kinetics. But first, let's begin with a chemistry cat of the day. What did iodine say to copper? I see you. <laughs> Cats are funny. After today's presentation is over, which will cover sections uh, 4 and 5 of chapter 14, you guys should be able to do the following. First, identify first and second order reactions by looking at their graphs. Second, perform integrated rate law calculations for first and second order reactions. Third, perform half-life calculations. Fourth, know how temperature affects reaction rates. Hint, it increases them. Fifth, describe the collision model and know the significance of molecular orientation. And sixth, perform activation energy calculations using the Arrhenius equation. I really wish Arrhenius had like three or four R's in his name, then I would call it Arrhenius. That's the lineup, let's get started. In our last lecture, to which I'll post a link right here, we learned that a general chemical reaction such as this one has a relative reaction rate equation, which is also called a differential rate law of this exciting stuff. You'll notice that we have negative signs in front of the reactants uh, changes in concentration over time, and positive signs in front of the products changes in concentrations over time, and that is because reactants disappear as the reaction proceeds while products appear. Relative reaction rate equations let us calculate how molecules' relative concentrations change over time. These equations do not let us calculate actual concentrations, only proportional concentrations of reactants relative to products. Does that make sense? Okay, so in an earlier lecture, to which I'll post a link right here, we also learned that for a general chemical reaction, such as this one, the general rate law equation, which is a little bit different from the relative rate equation, is this, where M and N are numbers that have to be determined experimentally. In other words, M and N are not the same as coefficients A or B in the balanced stoichiometric equation, although sometimes they occasionally can be, but if so, it's completely coincidental. M and N are called reaction orders for A and B. A reaction's overall rate order is equal to M plus N. The general rate law, this thingy right here, does not let us calculate how molecules' concentrations change over time. It only tells us how the rate will be affected by altering the individual concentrations of A and B. So what if we want to be able to calculate the actual concentrations of reactants and products for a reaction over time? Can we do that? The answer is, yes, we can. The equations we use are called integrated rate laws, and they combine elements from our relative reaction rate equations and general rate laws. <laughs> Man. So these equations vary depending upon whether your reaction is first order, second order, third order, and so on. We'll talk only about ones that are first order and second order in this class. So for ones that are beyond that, well, you'll have to learn it somewhere else, I guess. So I'm first of all going to teach you how to use an integrated rate law for first order reactions. A simple reaction that looks like A going to products can sometimes be, but isn't always, first order. That is where M, the little exponent in the uh, general rate law equation, is equal to 1. For such a reaction, negative change in concentration of A over delta T is equal to K times the concentration of A. In other words, this component, which comes from the relative reaction rate equation, and this component, which comes from the general rate law equation, happen to equal each other. So we can take this equation, this whole thingy up here, and use calculus. Calculus. OK, calculus isn't a prereq for this course, so I'm not going to show you how to do this using calculus, to transform it into this new equation. This new equation down here is called the integrated rate law for first order reactions. And yes, for students who take this from me in the class, I will give this equation to you on the exam. So you should notice that the integrated rate law for first order reactions, this equation right here, it has a formula of y equals mx plus b. I mean, it kind of does. This thing corresponds to y. The negative k corresponds to m, a slope. t corresponds to x. And this ln of a thing corresponds to b. So the graph of a first order reaction will show a straight line if you're plotting ln of a sub t versus time. Its slope is negative k, and its y-intercept is the ln of a sub 0. 
Let's contrast that then with a second order reaction. In contrast to what I just showed you, a simple reaction that looks like A going to products or A plus B going to products can sometimes, but isn't always, be a second order reaction in which the exponent is equal to 2. For such a reaction, this equation holds true, which once again blends an element from the relative reaction rate law equation with the general rate law equation. Or in contrast, if both A and B contribute to the reaction rate, as in this scenario where M and N are both 1, it's second order overall, you can get something different. For this class, however, we'll just consider the first equation up here, where I've got uh, k times the concentration of a squared as the right-hand component. So for this type of equation right here, we can transform it using calculus, calculus into this equation. Ba -ba -da -da. This is called the integrated rate law for a second order reaction, if you have a reaction that is second order with respect of only one reactant, a. Once again, for students who take this from my class, I will totally give you this equation on the exam. This equation, you should notice, also has a formula of y equals mx plus b. Don't believe me? I'll show you. If I take this and compare this 1 over a part to y, k to m, t to x, and this 1 over a part to b, it indeed looks like a y equals mx plus b equation. Here's the deal, though. The graph of a second order reaction will show a straight line if you plot 1 over a versus time. Its slope is k, and its y-intercept is 1 over a. According to our book, one way to distinguish between a first and second order rate law is to graph both ln of a and 1 over a against t. If the ln of a plot is linear, then the reaction is first order. If the 1 over a plot is linear, then the reaction is second order. So that's really distinct. So that's really the distinction. When you look at a graph of these, you have to look at what is plotted on the y-axis. If it's ln of a, then it's a first order reaction. If it's 1 over a, then it's second order. Got it? Good. Let's look at a question. Which of the following graphs shows the correct relationship between concentration and time for a reaction that is second order in a? Now, remembering what I just said, I'll let you try to answer this on your own. That takes us then to another question. The reaction A going to B is first order in A. Considering the following data, what is the rate constant for this reaction? You can pause the video now, see if you can figure it out on your own. You can then click this link to watch me solve it on the whiteboard. In a separate question, it asks, what is the concentration of A after 40 seconds? Once again, please click the link here to see how these are done on a separate video on the whiteboard. That takes us to the end of this exciting slash boring video. Please stay tuned to the next one in which I'll continue teaching you more about rate laws. Until then, I command you to have an enjoyable rest of your day.